Well, if you want to, you can go on over. Um, I'll let you go over to, um, let's have you go to Genesis 3, 7 to 11, and I'll get there in just a second by starting out with a few thoughts. Tonight we want to talk about tangibility. Something that actually we don't see a lot of anymore. Now, when I talk and I say statements like that, I don't necessarily mean you. I don't know you. But I travel around the country, and I happen to go from church to church to church to church and around the world and go to church to church. And so I'm seeing more of a consensus of what I'm saying here tonight. And if it fits someone here, then let it fit because it'll open your heart and open your mind to something more. But we don't see a lot of tangibility anymore. Tangibility of what? The presence of God. The awareness of the Spirit. And so in the place of tangibility, we've accepted more of a theological standpoint. Doctrine. We're more studious. We know scriptures and we die actually repeating them. Now, I didn't come here to fight tonight, so don't, don't get nervous, all right? But you got to say some of these things to do what? To help us to locate us. If you can't locate you, how can you locate him? You say, well, what do you mean by that? All right. Everything about growing up is about being somebody else. Very rarely are you able to be you. You act one way to your neighbor's uh, uh, your neighbors, another way to your neighbor's parents, your friend's parents, a different way to your parents. We've learned to act a different way to our teachers when you're in school. I know this because, you know, a couple years ago was our last teacher conference. My, my daughter's a senior this year, and a couple years ago we did one of those teacher conference things, you know, and, and it was about our, our daughter Chloe, real beautiful girl. And we went and we sat down. And this teacher looked at us and said, I just want to start out by saying if we had more, more uh, students in this school that are like your daughter, this would be a better place. And I said, well, I just wanted to clarify, we're, we're the Hockadays. <laughs> who, who are you talking about? He said, well, I'm talking about Chloe, Chloe Hockaday. And he said, yes. And I said, well, can you elaborate on what you're saying? And he said, well, I mean, she's just so smart. She gets her work done before everybody. And then she'll, on her own, go around the room and ask if anyone needs help with their homework. And I said, and you don't ask her to do this? And he said, no, I don't ask her to do this. And I said, and she does it on her own? And he said, yes. And the whole time this is happening, Aaron's pushed now her foot over to my foot, and we're pushing against our feet. In other words, in that kind of a way to say, are you kidding me? And I said, can you elaborate? Is there anything else? He said, yes. And at the end of each class, she'll come up and ask if there's any way that she can help me clean up. I said, she cleans? <laughs> and I was finding things out about my daughter that I had not known in about 15 years of seeing her from birth to this particular point. And when we got out of, out of that, that session, we looked at each other and said, okay, we can't wait till we get home <laughs> and let her know that if you can do this at school, you can do this, hello, at home. <laughs> See, we learn how to be one way to our teacher and another way to mom and dad. Hey, there's some relatives coming over. You, be, you guys better be good. Like us to say that we're not going to be good. And then, you know where I'm going with this. What's the possibility we learn how to be the way we are when we come to, yeah, to church? I mean, we're professional the way we lift our hands like we've been doing it all week long. <laughs> and maybe it's the first time we did it since the last time we came. Maybe it's the first time we praised out of our heart since the last time we came because all the times we're praising them are when we're in the car and we're actually distracted because we actually think that you can multitask in the spirit and you can't. I'll say it again, you can't. John said that. You can't love the things of the world and love God at the same time. You can't do that. And that doesn't mean don't pray in your car. It just means there ought to be time where you're actually very, what? Focused. Because what's the possibility that the lack of focus is the reason why we don't have tangibility? Because is he here tonight? Of course. He'll never leave, never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. 
Are some of these things helping? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's just get into a few of these things here. I believe the Lord's going to help us tonight. Okay, real simple thought here. Uh, Jesus told the disciples, he said, I want you to go preach this gospel, and then things are going to happen when you do. And we know they went out in Mark chapter 16, and when they preached, the Lord worked with them doing what? Confirming the word with signs following. Isn't that right? So notice what we have here with the signs following. It has to do with what? Tangibility. And remember when Jesus said, I and my father are one over in John chapter 10, and, and the Pharisees then rose up against him to say, who do you think you are? A man that you be God. You know, you, this is blasphemy. And remember Jesus made some comments. He said, well, for which of these miracles do you stone me? They said, well, not for a miracle, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. And then Jesus went on to describe, he said, well, if I don't do the works of my father, then you don't have to believe me. So he put everything about who he was on what he could actually perform or the tangibility of how real God was in his life. Right? Remember Paul? When Paul was preaching over in, over in uh, Acts chapter 18 and 17 and 18, Paul was over there at Athens and he was preaching, remember, at that big Oropagus and he made some of those statements, you know, about this is the unknown God in him we live, move, and have our being. Well, he didn't actually mention Jesus in there, did he? <laughs> he forgot to mention Jesus. And what kind of results did he have? They were terrible. That's the only place where Paul didn't establish a church. A few people believed in what he said. A few. And there's a whole huge crowd. Paul wasn't used to that. Remember over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where Paul came back and he began to give us a little bit of an understanding because he went from Athens right to Corinth. And remember what he said? He said, when I came to you, I came to you in fear and in trembling, not in the wisdom of man's words. In other words, not in my intellect by saying, okay, to the unknown God whom you serve. Well, in him we live and move and have... He said, I came here to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? That your faith would be in the power of God because he knew that when you go back to those simple thoughts, you can have a demonstration. Remember that? So what did Paul want in all of his meetings? Tangibility. Substance. Right? Come on, you're a little bit quiet tonight. Are you doing okay? All right. Well, this is the best it gets, so you kind of better, you know, like it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, you know. Another scripture right before I go over to Genesis is John 1, 14. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Notice what it says. And the word did what? It became what? Flesh. The word got into flesh so people could see the tangibility. That's what I mean by having scriptures with reference and all that we quote while we die. See, those scriptures are to do what? They're to turn into flesh so that you can behold the evidence of the scripture. Right? Because what makes the difference between us on one street corner and somebody else and their religion on another street corner? Jesus said, you'll know them by their what? Fruit, results, tangibility. Right? I'm over here in Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at when all this actually went south. It says, verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So all of a sudden they had knowledge of something that they had not had knowledge of before. Their nakedness. In other words, you could say it like this. When did Adam and Eve first recognize that they had bodies? Not really until they sinned. And when I mean recognize, what I mean is the body then became of importance because they had just lost what was the most important, which was what? The spiritual connection. The moment they lost that spiritual connection, the reason why they're looking for something to cover up with is because they had clothes on. Those clothes were heavenly clothes. Paul talks about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's groaning to do what? To be further clothed. Not unclothed physically, but to be further clothed heavenly. That his mortality may be swallowed up in the sea of life. 
One translation said, immersed into the sea of immortality. Paul wanted this flesh to constantly be under what? A tangible presence of God. And right here you can see when Adam and Eve sinned, guess what took place? They now became aware of their body. I've heard Brother Hagin say it like this a few times. He said, I've gone for periods of my life, sometimes five, sometimes up to seven years at a time where I didn't know that I had a body. Well, you say, you got to decipher that. What does that really mean? What that means is, is there's nothing wrong with the body to pull on him for what? Extra attention. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's a vehicle, just like the car is. Where are your cars right now? They're in a what? A parking lot designed for them to stay while you're able to come in here to a real warm place. Your body's not the real you. It's just a representation physically of you. But the real you is a spirit. And the more you make a difference between the two, the easier it is for you to make choices that connect you to God on a regular basis. Otherwise, guess what happens? You'll get your body so connected to the world that your body will start driving your car. It makes all of your choices. Oh my goodness, I'm not feeling today. Good today. What in the world am I going to do? Well, already... The value of your question is to actually give value to something in your body. Why could Brother Hagin say, I've gone five to seven years at a time without knowing I had a body? Because his connection to God was real enough during those five to seven years that there was nothing wrong with the body, which means very simply, the greater the connection with God, the less you'll have wrong in your body. Amen? Amen? Pastor, are they always this quiet? Yes? yes? Okay. So now let me get to the point of the message that we're giving you tonight and see if we can't go forward a little bit quicker. They exchanged the tangibility of the spirit for the tangibility of the flesh. Now they're looking for something like fig leaves to take the place of the anointing. And right here is where everything really went off key. The next thing you know, they got to leave the garden. You guys got to leave. Well, we don't want to leave. Why would we leave? Well, I told you, it's not going to be good if you, if you eat that apple. Did they get to eat that whole apple? How many bites did they each get to have? One. How absolute is God? I mean, pretty absolute. It might have been a good apple. They couldn't even finish it. It was over just like that. And God's already telling them, we got to leave. The Bible says he drove them out of the garden. Drove. In other words, with force that could not be withstood. I bet you they had heel marks as God was driving them out of the sand into a harsh environment. There's an angel set there so they can't get back in to get to the tree of life. And all of a sudden, their, their stomach grumbles. It rumbles inside, and they say, God, we're, we're hungry. And he says, well, that's on you. What do you mean it's on me? He said, food's on you. Well, aren't you going to cook tonight? He said, no, you're cooking. Well, we don't know how to cook. Well, you better learn. Where are we going to get the food? You have to grow that. Huh, we don't know how to grow food. How do you do that? It's going to be painful and sweaty. What's sweat? What's pain? And all of a sudden now they're introduced to a life and to a world that today is called through Jesus in Mark, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6, the life of the Gentiles. What is it? The world of you having to fend for yourself. And all of that fending for yourself is about how good you are with your flesh in a world of flesh and whether or not you're going to succeed by your own ability. And that's what we all fight the most because the grace of God does not need your help. Now, how good have we gotten with this world? Well, we're pretty good at it. Even Smith Wigglesworth said years ago, I foresee the day where it'd be almost next to impossible to see divine healing because of the rise of medical science. What do you mean by that? Well, as soon as you give people options, it's, you're all done. You're through. 
I'll give you an example. Does anybody remember what flavor it was that was created the first time ice cream was made? It was vanilla. Well, if there's only one flavor and you want ice cream, how hard is it to get committed to a vanilla cone? You, th this isn't, this isn't a, tr a trick question here. I mean, some of you are looking like, I, I don't want to say anything just in case I get it wrong. It's really okay. It's okay. All right, God actually wants to heal here in just a few minutes, okay? So, so we really need you a little bit looser than that so you can get healed, all right? Come on, I'm in your business for a purpose. My job, if I do it well, is to eliminate all your options. Now, some of you may be screaming bloody murder by the time I'm done because you don't want those options eliminated. But it's my job to get rid of your options until what? Until the only option left is Jesus and you're fully committed. So I'll go back to saying about the ice cream. If it's only one flavor, how hard is it to get committed to it if you want ice cream? It's easy. It's the same thing as saying the building's on fire. Oh, I think I'll stay for another hour and worship God. Well, no, I think you'll get out so that you can live. Right? The easier the choice the easier the decision, the easier it is to get all in and committed. Now I can give you an illustration that'll help you to understand. Baskin Robbins ruined everything. <laughs> sure. There's how many flavors? 31. And you know they knew what they were doing. You say, how come? Because when they made their ice cream, 31 flavors, they also came out the very first day with little tiny pink sample spoons. My daughters, when they were growing up, thought that the more spoons you had, the more you'd win a prize. <laughs> they'd have five of these little spoons in their hand because they'd get a sample. I'll have a sample of that. I'll have a sample of that. I'll have a sample of that. I'll have a sample of this. And while they're sampling, I'm licking my cone. I've already chosen. I grew up in a generation where it was easy to make a choice. And the interesting thing is when they finally get their cone, and sometimes it would be like bubble gum or something. Oh, my God, what a flavor, right? Talk about dye. They have three licks and their tongue is nothing but blue, right? Oh, this is so good. Oh, it's not good for you. Glad we don't come here often. Anyhow, while they're licking their cone and I'm almost done, they'll be looking at me while they're licking theirs. Your, your cone looks really good, Daddy. I said it is, honey. It is really good. Can I have a lick? I said you got five spoons. Plus you got your own cone. Well, can I have a lick? Well, of course I'd give them a lick, but I'd give them a hard time. For why? They, they, they finally, it took them 20 minutes to make a decision on their cone, and they still can't be committed to it. They still want to lick mine. <laughs> and when you begin to put all of this together spiritually, do you see what's happening to us? We're slowly being dumbed down to the point where we can't even make a real choice for Jesus. So we make a choice for Jesus while we're holding on to something else. Now, way back in 1860, a guy by the name of A.W. Tozier, he made this comment. He said, real faith is where you put yourself in a position on purpose where you can't go back. So you get out there so far, you can't go. If I wanted to, I can't. So I've got to turn around and face whatever obstacle I'm looking at and just say, come on, I'm in it for the long haul. Here we go. Let's just go over real big or go under if I have to live or die. People come up and there's times I can see they're hurting. I say, I'm going to hit you right where it hurts. You're going to do what? I'm going to hit you right where it hurts. You're going to hurt worse or you're going to be healed. Choose. You say, why do you do that? To make them make a choice. Right. Have you ever had anybody say, I think I'll choose to hurt worse? Never. So what takes place? The moment they say, well, I don't want to hurt. Good. You won't have to. Why? I'm getting them to do what? To jump in to something that's of God, not vacillate. Come on, let's go a little further. I know you're doing okay, all right? So we look a little further. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let me ask you a very simple question. I know this is kind of stupid the way I'm going to do this. Is that verse before or after 
The eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. I know, I know that's ridiculous. Of course it's after. But what does that tell you? This verse is a post-sin condition. God had to come in the cool of the day and find, where are you, Adam? And find him. That's post-sin. We still think that's what we're dealing with today. Trying to get the Holy Ghost to be involved in our lives. Trying to welcome them into our presence. What happened to the verses, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. What happened to those verses? Jesus was trying to do what? When he came out of the grave, he could restore us back to what it was like before Adam and Eve sinned. Where there was a continual presence, 24-7. He's never leaving you. He's always with you. Come on, the idea that Adam and God were separated is post-sin. All you got to do is go to the Alpha and the Omega. And the Omega, at the end of the, end of the book, is in Revelation, where God opens the city gates and says, never again will these gates ever be closed. Why? There'll be a coming and a going, a constant, what? Presence of God. If Adam and Eve didn't really recognize their body till after they sinned, then what was it like before they sinned? Is it possible that they were connected with God and he was so real to them that they could hear him, they could see him, they could feel him? Huh? Their spiritual senses were heightened to the place where they overrode physical senses? You know, we say we walk by faith but not by sight. But really, what do we actually think that is? Because we're so in tune with our physical senses to this world, we almost make it look like we're getting to walk by faith now. We're going to go out here into the ether and step out into the unknown. Well, why should it be unknown to a spirit? Shouldn't the spiritual world be recognizable to a spirit? In other words, shouldn't walking by faith become a development where the spiritual senses become heightened and actually dwarf the physical senses? I mean, you do realize when we get to the throne, we are going to see with spiritual eyes. And that fruit that you're going to bite into, you're actually going to have taste, taste buds, spiritual taste. And your spirit's going to be able to smell the beautiful flowers that look so amazing. And you're actually going to be able to hear the angelic choir that's singing and join in. Your physical man is the reflection of your spiritual man, not the other way around. So the idea that our physical senses are very heightened and we're good at these physical senses only means that you can get just as good and even more so by your spiritual senses. Isn't this what Jesus was trying to tell the disciples? Individuals that actually felt him, walked with him, heard him. John chapter 1, 1 John, when he talks about the, the, the word was manifested unto us. We heard him, we saw him, we touched him, we walked with him. And he gave us so much joy. We share this with you so that you will have the same amount of joy. Well, what kind of joy are you going to have if you never see him, you never feel him, you never touch him, you never walk with him? And Jesus said, it'll be to your advantage that I go, that I leave your physical presence, that I would send the Spirit to be what? Your guide, your teacher. What's he trying to say? You have more potential spiritually to know God than your flesh does to know Jesus if he were in the flesh. As good as we are with this flesh world, I can see you and I can touch you, brother. Your spirit knows him. And your spirit is in touch with him. You know, every cry, and I realize you can look at things differently. Someone can say, oh, Lord, God, I just want more of you. And I realize that's just their heart desire to want him. There's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. But at the same time, if that's all that person ever does, year after year, oh, Lord, I want so much more. I want so much. And they're really not any further along next year than they are last year. What actually is happening is the fact that they're saying, Lord, I want so much more of you is actually declaring that I don't have much of you. 
So maybe it'd be better to say, Lord, I'm full of you. I know you and you're everywhere. My God, how in the world could I not find somebody everywhere? Right? Come on, all the, all the oxen free. Come on, where are you? If God were playing hide and go seek, he's got all kinds of billions of galaxies we've not yet discovered. Right? No, God. If he created a kid's game, he created show and tell. God loves to show up. Let me ask you a simple question here. This is really going to possibly ruffle feathers, but stay with me. Come on, I'm a guest here tonight. Stay with me. <laughs> when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, Genesis 2, 7, he became a living being. Was he looking at a Bible or was he looking at God? Excuse me. Don't be afraid to answer that. It's okay. He was looking at God. So what does that tell you? Well, that's kind of the original intention, to find God. Now, in case somebody thinks I'm putting down the Bible, I'm not with what I'm going to say next. I'm actually giving the Bible its due place because everything about the Scriptures is to help you to find God. Everything about the Scriptures is to help you to experience Jesus. Everything about the Scriptures is to help you to hear the voice of the Holy Ghost and follow His leading. For God to bring the Bible into play was plan B. Plan A was to actually meet God. Man went off so fast, so far, that God had to find anybody with a relationship and write about it so the people actually didn't lose the idea that God was actually somewhere to be found. Right? Come on, Genesis chapter 3, they missed it. By Genesis 6, he's already destroying the human race. Huh? That's pretty fast. Do you ever remember Adam repenting or asking forgiveness? Which means what? He pretty well jumped into this new life of the flesh and the world, and that was it. It didn't take long for people to lose all sight of whether or not there really was a God. Do you remember what it said about Noah's generation? They did evil continually. And in this last day, our generation will be like unto Noah's. In other words, people are so aware of their flesh, so aware of the world, doing evil continually, not even aware of God at all. And that creeps into the church because we live so much of our time in the world. And the next thing you know, services where the presence of God used to just heal people left and right while they were sitting there. All of a sudden now, you have to have special services just to get that presence here where it was just a normal thing. Is this making sense to anybody? Yes. See, what I'm trying to do is open your heart and open your mind to something other than what you're experiencing. Because the moment that you get rid of clutter, that's what an open heart and open mind means. It doesn't just mean, okay, I'm ready to hear what you're hearing. Well, it depends on how much clutter is in there, whether or not you're actually going to hear it. Has your wife ever said anything to you guys? You know, when she's talking to you, you say, you ain't listening to me, huh? Why? Because there's clutter. You've got something else in your mind. Have your children ever done that to you? You can tell they're hearing me. They can even repeat it, but they're not doing it, not one bit. Why? Because it didn't even register. They've got clutter. Well, what if we were to get rid of that clutter? That's what I'm endeavoring to do tonight. Open up your mind and your heart to the idea that it should be normal for you to actually experience God. Not something special. Oh my gosh, Jesus said something to me the other day. Okay, but he really kind of wants to say things to you all the time. John chapter 14, verse 18. Let's turn there. John 14, verse 18. <clears throat> I'm really glad for some of you that have been having digestive problems because tonight will be the last night. Amen. We're going to minister to you. God will set you free and heal you. If you've got some type of tumor, lump or grump, uh, growth in your body, God will heal you, set you free of that too. Amen. There's individuals here right now, as far as your ankles are concerned, as far as your hips are concerned, you're being healed while you're sitting in the service. If you didn't know that, you know it now, so get ready to jump, get ready to move. If you need to, just get up, walk around in the back of the service and test out the fact that God's healing your hip and healing your ankles. Amen. 
How can you say that with such certainty? Because the moment I said the first one, which is what I prayed this afternoon, the other ones came. And if God brought those, he'll bring more. What? Just to help. God wants to assist us. He wants us to find him. Remember, show and tell. If you see him and experience him, you'll run and tell somebody about it. The more you tell about it, the more he wants to show you. The more he shows you, the more you want to tell. Do you remember Nathaniel? Jesus is gathering his crew, you know, his, his 12 boys. Remember that? And he said, well, there's an Israelite in whom is no guile, talking about Nathaniel. Nathaniel asked him, he said, well, how do you know me? He said, Nathaniel, I saw you while you were under the fig tree. And he knew that was a spiritual experience. He said, my Lord and my God. Look at what happened. Jesus declared himself to Nathaniel. Nathaniel then gave thanks, like Pastor was talking about. He gave thanks, or in other words, acknowledged Jesus. And then Jesus next said, well, I'll tell you what, that's right. I am awesome and I am wonderful. No, that's not what he said. He leaned in real close and he said, uh, did you like that, Nathaniel? Nathaniel said, yeah, I loved it. It was awesome, Lord. He said, would you like to see more? I'd love to see more. And guess what he said? If you'll hang out with me, heaven will open and angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. In other words, every time you experience him and you begin to acknowledge that experience of God, he'll show you more. When you see more, you, you acknowledge more. When you acknowledge more, you see more. For really, acknowledgement is an invitation. Come on, somebody. I'm sharing something here that's really important. You have somebody over to your house. You don't really know them, so you control the environment. You say, hey, come on in and sit right here. Huh? The first time you have them over, you don't say, hey, sit wherever. Have the run of the house. No, you don't. You don't know them. So you control the environment. Sit right here. Hey, I'm going to go get you a drink. And you come out with water and, and lemonade. But you've got sodas back there. You've got all kinds of, you know, uh, energy drinks back there. But you only offer them water and lemonade. You control everything. After about an hour, hour and a half, you'll stand up and say, man, it was great to have you over. I really enjoyed it. And you walk them to the door. You're controlling the environment the first time you meet them. Second time you meet them, it's a little bit more loose because you're starting to enjoy them. Third, fourth, fifth time. After 20, 30 times of, of getting around them, whether it's at your house or somewhere else, the next time they come over, you say, hey, have whatever you want. And they go back there to the refrigerator and they say, man, you got all kinds of drinks. And you're thinking, well, I had those drinks before too, but I didn't get them to you, you know. <laughs> but now you can have them and you can go to any room. You can use any bathroom in the house. You don't have to just use this one. You can use one in the back room if you want. I didn't know you had a bathroom back here. See, now you're giving them what? You're giving them more latitude. You're giving them more freedom because you're developing a relationship. And the more you do that with God, the more God will just walk through your house and everything that God touches, he blesses. And the next thing you know, you get up and you've got mag wheels on. Your, your, your gas tank's filled up. Your oil doesn't have to be changed for the rest of your life. It's a spit shine on your hood. And you're realizing, who in the world did this? It's because the more you get connected with God, the more you invite him to be a part of your life, the more God starts to take over. This is how you go from having to ask God for something to just thinking it, and it happens. Now unto him who's able, I didn't hear much amen on that except a clap back there and a little whoo, you know. Come on, this is where we ought to be living. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. You mean I can think it and it happens? It'll freak you out when it first happens that way. You think it and all of a sudden you see it and you go, oh my, I was just thinking that. Yeah, but you're staying connected, see. You're inviting them to be more a part of your life on a regular basis. So what does it do? It causes God to have more liberty. Come on, think about it. You know, if you were the genie in the lamp, wouldn't you want to be rubbed every once in a while so you could get out? If God's living in you, the God of the universe. Don't you think it's a little tight? Don't you think he'd love to express himself? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Come on, you remember those years? It took me forever to get my hand past my hip when I was worshiping God. We didn't raise our hands in church unless you had a question. 
So when I heard about lifting up holy hands, that's as far as I went. My little flipper only went that high. <laughs> Took me a few months all of a sudden to go like this. I felt almost embarrassed to raise them up. What am I doing? I'm keeping God locked up, man. Locked up in my personality. Locked up in the way that I see things. Locked up in the way that I do things. God wants to express himself and he's happy all the time. Come on, John chapter 14. Look at what it says. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a while, this is the Message Bible, the world will no longer see me. But you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the born again experience, isn't he? And notice what it says next. At that moment. This is a message Bible. At that moment. Not after a lifetime of study. Perfect attendance at church. And I'm not trying to tell you don't have perfect attendance. Man, you ought to be hungry to come and get the word and be around other believers. Amen. Amen. Run the aisles. Praise the Lord. Tell somebody about all the healings you've got. Tell somebody about all the acknowledgments of God's grace that you had all week long that shows how much God's doing in your life. Do you know what we tell individuals? Well, take a few moments and just greet one another around you. If you could hear some of the stories that are going, how are you doing? Doing terrible. The medication ain't working. How are you doing? Oh, the back's hurting a little bit worse. How are you doing? Well, they say I got to have surgery. How are you doing? Man, we just, we just lost some more of our money. I'll tell you what, you just be believing with me. If you could hear some of the things that are going on, church ought to be the place where you come. You're filled with so many testimonies. You can't wait to share what Jesus has been doing to you all week long. And you tell him four things. I mean, he's done all that. That's just this morning. <laughs> Why? Tangibility. Let me throw this in. God made human beings to be connected. Which means you are connected to something at all times. So if you're not feeling God... What are you feeling? If you're not hearing God, what are you hearing? If you're not seeing God, what are you seeing? Come on, God 101 FM still is there. Still there. It's still on the dial. It's just we got millions of other stations. And you start peeling off those onions of those stations and your attachment to other stations, and all of a sudden you begin to hear God's voice. He's been there all the time, He's been talking to you. He's been ministering to you. We've just not been picking up on those signals because we're used to other signals. Come on, folks. It's not as hard as we make it. It's not about works. God never leave you, never forsake you. If you're not hearing him, most likely all of your outlets have plugs in them. And if you've got one plug to God, that means take a plug out of an outlet so you have room to plug in to God. What's the possibility he's here right now? What's the possibility somebody's hip from the moment I said that someone's ankle no longer has pain? Hmm? Who in here is already experiencing that? Somebody over here? What about it, brother? What's going on? Your hip is healed? How's it feeling? Excellent. Wonderful. Was it hurting a few moments ago? And you're feeling good? Have you got up and tested it out and walked around? Okay. Well, don't, don't wait on me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is anyone else testify with this man? What's going on? Sis, are you, are you walking around on? Huh? How's that going? I have to be real careful. I was in one service in West Virginia, and it was theater seating like this. And I'm over there 15 minutes preaching. All of a sudden, this, this lady in the back gets up with her cane, puts her big old fur coat on, has two books in her arm, one of them a Bible, and has her purse in her arm. And she starts making it out like this out to the aisle. And then she starts walking real slow with this cane out the back door. And all I could think of was, oh, my God, you're, you're leaving. I, I, I got more to say than just 15 minutes. That's all you gave me, huh? And I got really ticked. So I just walked right off the platform, walked right up to her. She's just walking like this to the door, and all of a sudden I tapped her on the back. And she turns, and then she turned around like this because it was the preacher. And I looked at her and I said, Where do you think you're going? 
I said, if you're going to leave, I'll tell you one thing. Give me that cane right now. And I grabbed that cane out of her hand. And I said, now, I command you to be. And I slapped her on the head like that. And I said, be healed. She went, whoo, whoo. And all of a sudden, she started moving her legs. Like she said, my God, my God, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I said, all right, now you can leave. She said, I was just going to the bathroom. <laughs> Amen. I thought, you know, who takes their coat and all their books and everything to the bathroom? So, you know, I do get it wrong every once in a while. How you doing? Was it ankles or hips or what? You had to go to the bathroom too? Okay, I'll leave you alone. Amen. Sorry. Sorry. Was it, was it hips and stuff? Were you checking something out? Yeah? You could feel the heat and presence of God, couldn't you? Amen. So what's the Lord doing for you right now? What would you, you have a problem with? Amen. Will you tell us as you get, as you get testimony? Huh? And I'm not telling tell everybody here. I'm saying tell the pastor, tell the pastor's wife, all right? As you get the testimony, all right? Anybody else real quick? Yes, sir. Ankle's been killing you for months, but you got a smile on your face. Have you... Have you jumped up and down on it? Yeah. Good. Amen. Well, good, good. That's the way it should be. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, let's turn this night into a night where there's tangibility, all right? Let's read this scripture here, see if that's all that we'll do, and then we'll share a couple stories, and then we'll go ahead and minister to you. Notice what it says. At that moment, you will know absolutely that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. He didn't say after 20 years of study. Thank God for study. He said in the very moment that you get saved, you will know absolutely that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Well, what kind of salvation is that? Huh? That sounds like a real experience with God. Versus the idea that when you pray a prayer, it's just kind of a prayer, and then you got to go to classes to figure out what the prayer was. Sounds like right here, when you get saved, God, God jumps inside your skin, starts living in your laundry, starts walking around in your shoes, and all of a sudden you know it's like hollow ground. Somebody, where is he? He's in you. Huh? Where is he? He's in you. Is it possible we can open up our hearts and our minds to this kind of relationship? That maybe we haven't thought of this in this way. And maybe by opening up our hearts and minds to it, maybe we'll begin to sense God's presence. See, it's all about what you set your affections on. That's right. Paul said over there in, in uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter, chapter 6, he said, uh, you're living in the Message Bible, you're living life in a small way. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. In the King James, it says that you're restricting or you're not experiencing God because of your affections. What are our affections set on? Because if your affections get set on him, how real can he become? So I'm traveling with the singers and band. And back in the day, you know, when I got hired, uh, I'd been working out and everything. And so they made me the guy that uh, was going to um, watch Brother Hagen. And the way that they said it back then, I'm coming from a Baptist background, see, so we only knew that there were pastors and evangelists. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? That's not bad, but I mean, that's all we knew. So they told me, they said, I'm going to give you the job and make sure you don't drop the profit. I thought, well, it's a nonprofit organization. What in the world does that matter? <laughs> that's all I could think of was, you know, it's a 501c3. And they said, no, no, the prophet. I said, what are you talking about? I said, Brother Hagen. I said, oh, you got those, huh? Because I'm coming from a Baptist, see. I've just been filled with the Holy Ghost just a few months before I went. He says, yeah, he's a prophet. Whoa, don't drop him. No, I won't drop him. And they said, so if, if the anointing gets on him, I said, what's it going to look like? And, and, and Ray Jean was the one that always put me up to everything. He said, I'll tell you. So there, here we are at camp meeting. There's 10,000 people. This is back in the heyday. Brother Hagen's up there, and he's laughing, and he's going like this. Uh, uh, and his platform's moving back, uh, and he's laughing like this, and his feet aren't, aren't moving. And yet he's wobbling all around. He'd uh, like, go like this, and he'd laugh. And, and, and Ray Jean looks at me and said, now go. So I ran up behind Brother Hagen, and I got real close. So how come he got so close? Because he's got a real big belly and had real skinny legs. If he was going to go over, if you didn't get him down low, boy, you're going with him. Because it's my job not to drop the prophet. 
So I, I'm his skin. He'd turn, I'd turn. He'd turn, I'd turn. And all these people are looking at me up there. <laughs> so finally, Brother Hagin says, well, as you can see, I'm going to have to just have some of these singers come down there and minister to you. He said, because the anointing of God settled down in my legs. He said, he said I can barely feel them. He said, I I'm not going to be able to come down there and minister to you. He said, Annie, come on up here. And he turned and I turned. He didn't even know I was there. And she walked up, put her hands out like this, and he put his hands in her hands, and he said, now take this to the people and minister it to them in the name of Jesus. And she went off like this because it was on a big platform. She had to walk way to the back, go down the stairs, and then come way out to where the people are. It's in a convention center, so there's a lot of room in there, a lot of walking. Now, what happened next, I was not aware. I wasn't even thinking. I'm just trying to concentrate and nervous as can be because all these people are looking at me of just making sure I don't drop the prophet, you know. <laughs> I forgot that he always would use Dean too. Dean was the drummer and the drums were directly behind the pulpit. So all of a sudden he turns around and he's right there. <laughs> and when he turned around and saw me, he goes, ah! <laughs> and when he did that, it scared me. I went, ah! And now my reactions are pretty slow because I don't know what to do. We're this close, and he backed up, and I backed up. And so I kind of leaned over like this, and he leaned over the same place. <laughs> so I went real quick this time over here, and here he comes, like a delayed reaction over here. I, I could have had lunch. It took so long. And he looks at me, and he goes, like that, like you're in my way. And I thought, well, I got here first, you know. And now he's staring me in the face, and we're, we're like this. And so finally I stepped up, and I stepped back, and this is what he did. He just looks at me like this, looks down at my shoes, my pants, my suit, my tie, looked at my hair, because I was always getting checked to make sure it wasn't too long. The dean back then would come, and he'd have a ruler, and he'd check my hair. So you need to get it cut. I said, go talk to Mom Hagen. She likes it. And then he'd have to leave. <laughs> so he looked at my hair, looked back at me and said, well, all right, I guess you'll do. <laughs> this is my introduction into the ministry? Are you kidding me? I guess you'll do. <laughs> so he said, put your hands out. And I put my hands out. And he put his hands in my hands. And he said, take this. And the moment he said, take this, I felt something going go to my hands and I flinched. He said, take this down to the people and minister it to them in the name of Jesus. And then he leans and he said, make sure you use the name of Jesus. I'm thinking, I read your book, The Name of Jesus. I graduated from your school. What am I going to do, say, in the name of Ted? You know, I'm thinking, this is a little bit embarrassing, you know. I guess you'll do and then has to tell me twice, make sure to use the name. What, is it the hair, you know? I mean, I think I'll forget. So now I do, you got blonde hair too. I'd be careful about laughing that hard. Anyhow, so now I don't know what to do with my hands. Do I stick them in my pocket? Do I hold them? So I held them out like little platters and walked all the way. I didn't know what to do, but I felt what he put in my hands. And the moment I got down and touched the floor, what went into my hands began to beat like a heartbeat. And the closer I got to the people, it began to come out of my hands and started going up my arms. And now I'm pretty freaked out. Because, oh my gosh, there's something in my hands. And the first person I went to, in the name, and I didn't even touch them, I just wound up to get them. <laughs> And boom, they hit the, hit the dirt. The usher caught them. Now, you don't do everything you want to do, but everything inside of me wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> because all of a sudden, it's like, hello, these babies are loaded. <laughs> and there was a confidence in me because I knew something was there. See, tangibility. Yes. Tangibility. Your allegiance is always to the place of greatest tangibility. That's why with so many options anymore, with sickness and disease and all the doctors and all the things that we can do, we immediately run to them and say, Lord, you know what? We're believing you. I'm not telling you not to go to the doctor. If you're going to go, go and 
Get all you can get. But what I'm saying is, do you see the divide now that we've created? That's what Wigglesworth was talking about. Medical science will rise up like, like Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. It'll give people so many options, they'll lose that all in option with Jesus. How did David get to the battle to win over Goliath? He kind of tiptoed, you know, just check it out. No, he, he pretty much ran to the battle. Huh? This little old thing just ran right to him, couldn't wait to get to him with that. Huh? See, when you don't have any other option, all the chips in, or you could say it this way, you bet the farm on God. People began to fall just like flies. It was amazing. And that anointing became stronger and stronger and stronger. And every time I tell that story, it's just like you telling a funny story that took place 15 years ago. And while you're telling it, some of those same emotions come back. Your voice starts to crack because you're getting ready to laugh because the punchline to you was so funny, you can't wait to tell it. Because you're bringing back feelings and emotions. And every time I tell that, it's just like what Jesus told Brother Hagin, tell it to the people. When you tell it to the people, if they'll believe that I saw you and put my finger in each one of your palms, that anointing will flow out of it. In other words, the more that you tell it, the more it'll work. And the more he tells it, the more he thinks about it, the more he feels it. I was in his home. Someone asked me to take a prayer cloth to him. So I made sure when I gave it to him that I didn't just give it to him. I'm always wanting to find out scientifically how this stuff works. So I kept the cloth on my hand and made him put his hand on my hand with the cloth between us. I wanted to know when does the power come out of his hand? At what moment? Because that's useful for me when I was in healing school. I want to be able to release that power. Come on, we do things like that. I'd go sit in chairs and pray in the Holy Ghost for 30 minutes, and that afternoon, all those students would come in, and 30 minutes into the message, two of those two people where I had my hands and sitting in that chair would jump up and say, the fire of God's on me. My God, what's going on? And the whole place take off dancing. <laughs> and that's right where we were sitting. What are you doing? You're getting used to the tangibility of God because he's real. And the, and the question is, can he become more real to us? Jesus never complained that his body kept him from the reality of his dad. He never said, you know, that was a pretty good job, but I could have done a lot better if it weren't for this body. He never complained about it. He never said the body hindered him, which means you can be in your body and be very spiritually aware and alert. Come on, look at what the scripture says over 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. It says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Instead of using that for death, use that for life. The more absent from the body you are aware, the more spiritually aware of the presence of God you can become. And so if you're not sensing the presence, what does that mean? But you're more aware of the body. Come on, like an old-fashioned balance scale. Does that make sense? Brother Hagin had his hand, I'll get right with you, sir, had his hand on my hand, and that prayer cloth was underneath, and this is what he said, Father, thank you for healing. Thank you for the work that Jesus did. He shed his blood and took our, our, our sicknesses and our disease that we might go here. Nothing, nothing's going into me. He's just talking. And then this is what he did. And right after he said that, he goes, and now, Father. So now he's switching gears, and I'm paying attention. And now. Thank you for the anointing that you have anointed me with. Now, what's he doing? He's remembering what it was like for Jesus to put his fingers into each one of his hands. And when he remembered that, the moment he said that, poof, power went into my hands. And I felt it go into that cloth. And I thought, there's your key right there. The more aware you are of him, the easier it is to release him. Someone says, hey, I need five bucks. Can you help me? Yeah, I got it. Here's some, got somewhere. Let me check. Man, I, I, I know I have five. I, I know I have it. So how good are you at releasing it? You're not very good at all. Just to say you know you got it don't help you if you can't put your hands on it. Hey, you got five dollars? No, I don't have it at all. Well, you sure can't help them then. You got five dollars? Hey, I got a 20. Will that help? And you pull it out of your hand. How easy is it to release what you're so aware of and so confident in?